Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Fall Technical Conference webinar series. Uh, please remember to silence your, keep your microphones silenced to minimize background noise and use the Q&A box when you have questions. The Fall Technical Conference is uh, um, hosted annually by four organizations, the Chemical and Process Industries Division and the Statistics Division of the American Society for Quality and the Section on Physical and Engineering Sciences and the Section on Quality, quality and Productivity from the American Statistical Association. The goal is to engage researchers and practitioners in a dialogue that will lead to more effective use of statistics to improve quality and foster innovation. For more information, please visit falltechnicalconference.org. The 2022 Fall Technical Conference is scheduled for October 11 through the 15th in Park City, in Park City Utah. Please save the date. This is the first in a sequence of webinars associated with the 2021 uh, Fall Technical Conference, the next of which will be uh, this coming Friday, October 15th. For a full schedule and details, please visit falltechnicalconference.org slash FTC dash webinar dash series. Today's talk is associated with the 2020 William J. Uden Address. The speaker is chosen based on being a recognized leader in the development or application of statistical methodologies, extensively promotes statistics and statistical applications to everyday problems, being well published, and being a vibrant and passionate speaker. The 2020 award committee was Ashley Childress, Mindy Hotchkiss Chair, Byron Smucker, and Brian Weaver. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce Mike Hamada, who has been a research scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory since 1998. Mike is a fellow of the American Statistical Association, the American Society for Quality, and Los Alamos National Laboratory. He has received many accolades, including the Quality Engineering Best Reliability Paper twice, the Quality Engineering Soren Bisgard Award, the very first Gerald J. Hahn QNP Achievement Award, the Technometrics Frank Wilcoxon Prize, also twice, the John Wiley and Sons Award in Probability and Statistics, an R&D 100 Award, and the American Society for Quality Brumbaugh Award. Mike also holds two patents. He is unquestionably well published with two books, Experiments, Planning, Analysis, and Parameter Design Optimization, and Bayesian Reliability. And he has more than 180 journal papers, proceedings papers, and technical reports. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Kamada. Okay, I guess I'll, I, oh. So do I need to share my screen? Yes. <laughs> oh. So, there you go. Can you see it? Yes. Uh. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. You're on the, on the picture of, of, of uh, uh, yeah, there you go. Great, thanks. Um, well, thanks for all the help too, uh, Sarah and um, Mickey and Adam. We we practiced last week. Anyways, it's a, a real honor, and I think you understand it after I end my talk uh, just how much an honor I, I you know realize it is after spending uh, time reading you then. So the, um, so thanks uh, to uh, Mindy and, uh, 
and the uh, committee for selecting me. And uh, actually, Adam and the NIST library were really helpful in finding a couple really hard uh, to find publications, Uden publications. Also, Jim Phillip and, uh, gave me a, a helpful perspective on this. Of course, Adam, Adam and uh, Jim are at NIS, National Institute of Standards and Technology. And that's where UDIN worked when it was known as the National Bureau of Standards. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, some, uh, some backstory on the title. Um, so Mindy uh, contacted me March of last year. By April, FTC had been canceled. So I've had uh, 18 months to get ready for this. So what do you do when you have that much time? You start reading Uden. Uh, let's see, how do I get to the next book? Oh. So you start reading Uden. Here's my office in January of this year in a, a well, semi-organized, um, piles of Uden material. And so that includes five books, more than 110 papers. There were at least six obituaries and short biographies. And then the two Uden addresses by um, John Cornell and Jim Philbin were you know, very detailed. Uh, so in the talk, I'll refer to B, 1960 is a book, and uh, that particular one collects the 36 columns that he published in statistical on statistical design in the Industrial and Engineering Chemistry Journal, and that's detailed in the Trello uh, bibliography, and then in the Joyner and Wampler uh, bibliography, it has all his more than 110 papers and other books. And so I'll have a P, like 1961C. He had a lot of papers in 59 and 61. Okay, so where's the title come from? So, you know, after reading nine months at the beginning of January, I'm going, well, I got a lot of facts. I have a lot of technical details about specific problems. You know, how am I ever gonna give a talk? I've been thinking for some time about passing things on, especially to you know the younger people in my group at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Um, and you know, when looking at this material, I realized that uh, you then has a lot to say about the job that we do at uh, in the Statistical Sciences Group at Los Alamos National Lab as applied statisticians. He says a lot about um, the practice of statistics and then just lots of examples about how uh, applied statistical research arises in uh, me, you know, carrying out your projects, helping out your um, clients. And so that's kind of the basis for the title and then We'll see that you know he starts out as an analytical chemist. By the time he joins N National Bureau of Standards NBS, he is a applied statistician. And the punchline is that you know by the end, he's cl clearly a master applied statistician. Here's a picture. Uh, he retired in '65, and so he only had a few years. After that, when he you know passed away more than 50 years ago in April of this year. Uh, so uh, you know, here's an outline. Uh, when did he become a statistician? And then the, the two main points, what he says about the practice, what we can learn about the practice of statistics and how applied re you know, statistical research is, arises. And then kind of throughout, even from the beginning of his thesis, 
uh, PhD thesis in 1924, experimentation and measurement are entwined throughout. So let's start out. Uh, when did he become a statistician? Here's a brief uh, professional. Um, professional uh, history. He gets his PhD in 24. He has a, from Columbia University, he uh, has a undergrad degree in chemical engineering. And then he starts work at this newly formed institute, Boyce Thompson Institute for Plant Research in Yonkers. So it's only about 10 miles or so from uh, Columbia University in New York City. He's there from 24 to 47. He has a three-year stint uh, as a civilian in the Air Force Operations Analysis Group. Um, at that time, it was part of the Army in you know, World War II. And then he joins the National Bureau of Standards in, from 48 to 65. So when did he become a statistician just from things uh, I picked up from his life uh, before National Bureau of Standards? He gets a PhD in analytical chemistry. He develops a zirconium determination method. So it, he knows about doing experiments. He knows about developing precise measurement methods. And then he, uh, joins uh, BTI, Boyce Thompson Institute. And so he's you know, frustrated with the existing analyses of this highly variable bio biological experimental data he's dealing with now, you know, with plants. Somehow in 25, he finds uh, students, uh, 1908, paper that offers a glimpse with the T statistic for one sample and the T distribution. And then in 1928, again, I am, you know, somehow he finds Fisher's uh, 1925 book on statistical methods for research workers. And that is kind of the key to him becoming a statistician. Uh, he finds ANOVA as a, uh, statistical yardstick. Uh, there's uh, beginnings of uh, design based on and randomization based on, the, uh, so the randomized block and Latin square designs are only in the last nine pages of this book. He takes uh, Hotelling's course at Columbia, so he has to go cross town in 1931. Hotelling is a leading proponent of fish in the US at that time. Uh, there's note that he drives up to Cornell in 31 to show him a design. You don't, there's no details of what design he showed, but that it was a 230 mile drive, at least by today's roads. And who know, knows what it was like in 1931. And then Fisher's uh, 1935 design of experiments book, this is published and then expands on the previous book, plus you see factorial designs and uh, the randomization distributions, other things. And then he goes and spends a year with Fisher um, on the sabbatical. You know. And he also takes Gertrude Cox's design experiments course at the time it was called the NC State college and she had just joined that year to start the Department of Experimental Statistics. Okay, what about his uh, publications? There's evidence of him really applying Fisher and uh, you know, learning or applying statistics. So we mentioned his thesis. Gary knows about doing experiments. In another paper in 31, uh, here, I think he's maybe not really using statistics yet, but he knows about experimentation. He limits a source of error in his, by planning and eliminates another one by differencing the, day, the measurements. 
And then a, a Gemin 31 using Chu Hart's uh, relation. Uh, he shows the impact of measurement error on estimating the population var variation using the observed data. And he presents it as a graph, graphical method. So he's already starting to use graphical methods for explanation. In 32, uh, he cites this three to one rule for minimum ratio that the, you know, the population variance has to be three times the um, error variance. He, and then he uses Latin squares and ANOVA. He invents the Uden square design. And then the next, you know, by 37, we'll talk more about the Uden square. 37, he's using incomplete block designs and Latin square designs. He uses multiple regression. And then remember he's off, oops, it says your internet connection is unstable. So let me know. <laughs> what? Seems so okay right now. Happen. What's that? Seems okay right now. Okay, let me know if I lose it and I have to call in. Okay. Uh, the, um, okay, and then the three year stint in the Air Force. Uh, this is a great article by Miser uh, where he talks about, you know, Uden uh, taking small samples of a very large data set and analyzes them to get ideas before. I think he tackles the larger data set. And then there's this story about this one experiment that's brought to Uden to analyze. And it's a, he re, you know, recognizes it's a Latin square so he can use ANOVA, but maybe the most expensive Latin square ever done because it's an actual, you know, planes, uh, running bombing missions on four ta targets involved four planes and then four plane positions, you know, one, two, three, four in formation. And so this, um, um, you know, his contributions to the group and Newton himself, uh, you know, he presents the results to the bombers, bombardiers as bombing charts, again, this graphical method. And kind of the, I mean, the importance of this work can't be, you know, understated. Um, he wins the uh, Medal of Freedom, the President's Medal of Freedom. So back then it was the civilian award only for military um, contributions to, you know, national security. And um, the impact, of it was that it really improved the accuracy of the bombing, which was abysmal before, you know, they started, you know, this group started. And then the other thing is he saved lives of, of bombardiers uh, by, you know, this, what he was proposing, uh, increased the safety of the, the, the bombardiers. Anyway, some interesting backstory you know, and this is before, you know, the, well, the main career that we know about. So in 47 and 48, this is before he joins uh, NBS. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a turning point in these, with these three papers, a talk and, well, two papers. He begins to make the case for statistical design for physical, uh, for the physical sciences. You know, everything had been motivated by agri you know, the agricultural experiments. And he advocates for better designs, uses ANOVA to show how much, you know, can be learned by a small amount of data. We'll, we'll talk about this a little more. And then I think it's in the 48 paper, he talks about in the laboratory studies. So he's already thinking about, uh, you know, how good is a method? Can it be used across many laboratories? And actually there, it's an interesting 
there's a hymn of this youth and plot that you know most point to the uh, 1959 paper 11 years later but he was hymning at it even back in 48 so by the time he joins uh NBS, he's an applied statistician. And he really here and then throughout the rest of his career, he advocates for statistics as a you know statistical missionary to scientists and engineers. Uh, I may get off track a little bit. We, if we don't cover everything, it's okay. I'm writing up a paper for quality engineering. That has more details, but there are a couple fun stories about uh, him uh, joining NBS. So the 47 paper is a talk in New Jersey. Church of Eisenhart goes there. He's the uh, leader of this statistical engineering laboratory at NBS, and he hears uh, Uden's talk. He says, oh, this is the man we want to have, but he's uh, lamenting to a colleague, you know, how can I ask him? Yudin's already making $15,000 a year. Remember, this is 47. The director of the National Bureau of Standards, you know, the whole director uh, was only making 9,000. So how could he ask, you know, Yudin to come? His friend says, well, don't answer for him. Go ahead and ask him. So he he asks Yudin, and Yudin says, oh, you know, NBS is my Mecca. And, and so I guess today we would say it's, it, it's my dream job. So he joins NBS at that point. Um, and so, you know, the rest of the talk is mostly, you know, from uh, his uh, publications experience at National Bureau of Standards. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure if I quite have this right, but think about 1947, there really weren't computers. Um, I think there was this Omni tab that came out of the same statistical engineering laboratory right near when he retired, maybe 62 to 65. So he didn't have any computer packages. There were no graphics. Oh, you had to do everything by hand. I guess you had a calculator and you had random normal tables. I think that's about it. So it'd actually be good to hear from some of the NIST people. How did he do this anyway? So we'll get started. Uh, what can we learn about the practice of statistics from him? He applies statistical thinking. He advocates for something new, which was mainly design experiments. He teaches by connecting with something the client already knows or familiar with, and then he clearly explains results, of course, emphasizing graphical methods. So we'll go through this. Uh, I guess Adam will remind me of the time I already forgot to start the timer. So I need about 15 minutes before I get to the last section, which is, uh, you know, the statistical research part. Uh, okay. Right. Applied statistical thinking. So, you know, he's a chemist. Uh, he writes a book in 1951 for statistics for chemists. And so one of the big things that chemists do is they always do duplicate measurements. And then, you know, from reading uh, Uden that, you know, if they don't like one of the measurements, they'll take a third one. And they throw out the suspect one and report the average of the two closest, so-called best two out of three. So he, so he studies this by taking 400 sets of random normal numbers. He has to do this by hand to show how often and far out an outlier it can be. Um, and that's kind of hard to tell which one's the outlier. And then also mentions that the best of two out of three ever average is actually less precise than just using 
the duplicate average. I don't think we're going to go through all these details, but over and over he warns not to round measurements like to you know, to the significant digits because you're losing information about precision. Uh, at least when you're, you know, assessing the precision of a measurement system. And maybe just this middle point, he uses permutation distributions to argue results. And a couple of these are related back to the best two out of three. We're not going to go through all the details uh, here. And then, uh, then, you know, the big thing he advocates for uh, statistical design. Uh, back to the talk he gave in 1947. Oh, by the way, this talk is at NIST or NBS. So I don't know whether it was his job talk or what, or, you know, it was, must have been after that conference at Eisenhart saw him at in New Jersey anyways. With this small experiment, you know, he's refuting the kind of what the common, what people, you know, scientists thought about statisticians, that they can't be of any help unless there's a lot of data. And he goes on to make the point with this experiment with very little data, 16 measurements that, you know, you can learn a lot about measurements. So there were two operators uh, and uh, you could uh, determine whether their intercepts were the same. Or the, in other words, their accuracies, you could compare them and then there, the regression, when you fit a regression, the slopes are related to calibration uh, ability of the two operators. So in the small experiment, you're learning a lot about the measurement system. Uh, many places he talks about the basis for error being the same. Again, uh, from the chem for the chemists, if you use duplicates uh, and the error within the duplicates and they're measured in parallel on the same day, they're not going to be relevant if you're collecting your data to compare treatments, different treatments over days. Yeah, this was kind of neat uh, where he uh, shows that uh, this idea of a composite reference versus the client's standard reference. So it'll be clear on this slide here. So let's say you want to compare seven thermometers. The standard way that the chemist would do would be run them in pairs. The, each thermometer with a reference thermometer. And then by, you know, the, you know, by the differences or comparisons with the reference, you could compare the different thermometers. Well, um, Uden uh, proposes this uh, balance and complete block design. The um, columns are the blocks. And, um, and uh, it's a balanced and complete block design. You know, you can only run three thermometers in each block. So there, so, you know, how does he motivate the analysis and not, or the design? No, it's that you're gonna get similar, something like, you know, what you're used to. And so we're not going to go through all the details, but you kind of come down to the bottom line that the effect of uh, thermometer C relative to this average correction, you know, you, you get an estimate from the data. And so this average correction is like a composite reference. And then for all the other uh, thermometers, you can get a similar, you know, A minus that same average correction, and you get an estimate. So I think, you know, the, they bought into that, plus it saves using the reference, especially when the reference is uh, 
tactics, you know, is this or the measurement is destructive that you lose a, me a lot of a lot of reference material, for example. And, you know, so he doesn't do this in the analysis. Of course, he uses ANOVA, but to get by and I think from the uh, from his clients, it was amazing how he motivated that analysis or the properties of the design. Of course, he explains things clearly um, to using graphical methods. Uh, this is the uh, Uden plot um, on the right uh, where uh, you, it's a way to analyze inner laboratory study data or ILS. And so the, you have a method, you think it's ready for prime time. So there's a sponsoring laboratory. So they get an inner laboratory study uh, done. So that means it's uh, getting lots of labs to use the measurement method. And then, um, and so, and one of his recommendations is you measure, you send out pairs of similar materials and then each lab will measure each of the two materials. And then you plot it, you know, the, the first one on the x-axis, the second on the y-axis. And so here's of a plot about, you know, 29 labs from that original 1959 paper. So remember that avoiding duplicates. So he's avoiding this all together by, you know, them measuring two different things. And what's kind of neat is that he says, well, you know, what, what might the statistician do? They're just gonna run an ANOVA. And the conclusion is that the labs are different. Of course, they know that because there are these biases from lab to lab that are just inherent in you, you know, having different uh, solvents or and different machines and different people and everything else. There are going to be some differences, but the point of the ILS is, is it's small enough that you can use this method, of, you know, across the world or the nation. And so it's kind of neat. We won't go through this, but just by interpreting the two-way plot, the Uden plot, you can say something about, you know, whether this method is ready, you know, whether it's a single lab, a sloppy lab, a lab just doing its own thing, um, and so forth. Um, and then in one of the statistical design columns, he motivates uh, ANOVA uh, graphically. Maybe we won't go through the details, but with eight data points uh, in pairs, uh, and then this is a 45 degree line through the average of the data uh, for uh, process X and Y, uh, the, you know, projection, distance of the projections and the projections along the 45 degree line and so forth, he relates it to ANOVA. So it's, you know, I haven't seen any of this, it's pretty neat to me. And then uh, just in his book uh, for statistics for uh, chemists, he presents uh, a bunch of designs graphically. Again, I'm not sure if I've seen it this way, just because we met, you know, didn't have to do this by the time we can use computers. Anyways, here's the full factorial, two levels in four factors. Here's the, in six factors, two levels, a half fraction and 32 runs, the, you know, the asterisks. Here's the two to six minus two, uh, six factors, a quarter fraction in uh, 16 runs. And then he also uses 
uh, these and so those are the ones here is that design and then he illustrates well what if you follow up with factors b c and d then in this upper con uh, quadrant besides the ones you add the twos to get a two to the four minus one and then further if you just concentrate on b c and that factors you just do the upper two to the uh, four uh, you know eight runs anyways so this is neat stuff to me and um then in his book experimentation and measurement i don't know how well this comes out uh but he and remember, oh, well, remember this book was intended for high school students. And, uh, you know, he talks about the normal distribution as a key statistical model. And, you know, here's from his BTI days, uh, plants ordered by growth from left to right. And so, you know, the small peony ones are over on the left, the bushy ones are way on the right. And then uh, a couple pages later, I didn't know this was, or I'm not sure I knew this was, you know, Uden had done this again in this book. I mean, this is all over the internet, but, you know, he had a home printing press, so he typeset this. Um, this book, Experimentation and Measurement, you can get a free copy as a, NBS special report, you know, just search for it on the web, special report uh, 672. It's pretty amazing. I, I mean, I recommend you reading it. So it's, you know, you, you think it's for high school students. The first time I read it, you go, oh, wow, he's done a really nice job. He's done lots of neat things about measurement and uh, experiments, and then you, he gives you things to do to, you know, where you can do actual measurements, take actual measurements and learn about measurement and experiments. You read it a second time, third time, maybe fourth, fifth time. Uh, you realize that in this small book, he's saying things in a very few, sometimes very few sentences. Uh, just these profound things that he's learned about experimentation and measurement that are scattered throughout his, you know, four other books and more than 110 papers. I mean, just some profound stuff. It's easy to just, you know, read it quickly, but it, if you read it carefully, you'll realize how, I mean, profound what he wrote actually it is. And then on uh, presentation of results. I didn't realize that he also said, let the data speak for themselves. I'm sure there are others. And then he just says another, these neat quotes about being clear and simple in uh, explaining results, developing uh, models and um, methods. Uh, okay, now, how much time do I have, Adam? I need a uh, tw It's 20 minutes to, 20 minutes till two. But do I have about 10 minutes or what? Yeah, absolutely. At least that. Okay, At let's, least. What, or what can we learn about applied statistical research? He invents new designs. He, uh, well, then in our laboratory studies, we've already talked about the one thing. Uh, he has new no, novel uses of existing methods. I want to at least get to that. He develops new analyses driven by uh, project needs. So I think the other talks uh, and not elsewhere, there's certainly been the emphasis on designs the Uden square, which is actually an incomplete block design. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but, and then with an added factor, 
There's link block design and chain block designs to reduce experimental resources that ever, you know, things that is uh, clients, you know, really required if, you know, that was possible. Again, pair designs eliminates um, an environmental factor you just had to deal with if you were gonna do the experiment. Partially replicating Latin squares. And then in, again, uh, sequential design. So that, that's a, this is a fun one. So we'll go through examples. So we saw this balancing complete block design that's actually a human square. You know, he developed in 1937, but he's applying this at NIST. And so, you know, the, the columns are blocks, but the rows are uh, another blocking factor. And so, um, to account for the order of reading in the rows. And, uh, but this came out of his BTI days where the columns were plants, you know, along a wall of a, of a nursery greenhouse. But the rows were, you know, how close each of the rows were to the, uh, greenhouse wall. So he wanted to account for possible difference of being closer to the glass windows of the greenhouse or not. Anyways, neat stuff. Link block designs. He has more objects than uh, so to reduce the number of um, the experiment. He runs them in blocks, but there's a single link, you know, a common treatment like A to A between block one and two and so on. And so there's just a single link and this is the link block design. I think one of the things he's counting on with the physical experiments is, is that the measurement error is pretty small. So I think that's one of the reasons he can uh, have these kinds of designs that just, you weren't gonna do this with agricultural experiments. And then the chain block design, here's a couple of them. You've seen this before in other UDIN talks, but so now you have two links become a chain. So I, I should back up. It's, it's like, you know, he just developed these designs for his projects. And it was the theoretical and combinatorial designers that came by afterwards and said, oh, this is a placket, I mean, a PBIB, partially balancing complete block design. And I think, you know, this uh, uh, kind of invigorated new uh, research in PBIB, you know, combinatorial design. Uh, same thing with the chain block designs, except it's it's not a PBIBD. Uh, he does these calibration designs, you know, to compare different therm thermometers, for example, uh, relative to uh, a reference thermometer. Again, if you do balancing complete blocks, you're going to have uh, a lot of uh, a big experiment, but if you do this like paired designs, which means you have, in this example, you have eight thermometers, you break them up into two groups of four and you, and it's all pairs between one group and the other. So you cut down on this experiment, but yet you can analyze it to, and use it for what he wanted. And the issue here was there was a, you know, temperature was changing, but it was the same when he used, you know, used the two uh, thermometers to measure it. So here and many other places, he talks about, you know, how the, the traditional experimenter would spend a lot of time or resources and to try and control things like temperature, but with design here, you didn't have to do that. 
Um, some may have seen this before where he replicates the Latin square like the A, A, B, B, and C, C. And then it's telling that this quote from the Cornell Youth and Address uh, by his co-author, uh, we all know Stu Hunter, uh, just a quote here that he didn't care to get involved with mathematics of the problem. He just looked at the block treatment pattern and would say it's right or it's not. And he had an intu intuition about balance and symmetry of designs. So he had an intuition and then he could validate. I think maybe that's how he developed the youth and square. He knew what he wanted and he could check it once he developed it. Here's a neat example where, uh, let's see, was it seven uh, temperatures? Uh, you could uh, run, uh, comparing seven temperatures, you can run it in blocks of three as a BIBD, but you could start out with four temperatures, A, C, D, and E, in this uh, one in the lower hand, uh, which is a BIBD of size two, and then it's embedded in this larger design. So I've never seen this before either. Uh, we, we talked already about the Uden plot, and so we won't go through that, except after he retired, he uh, somehow got connected with pathologists. Here's an example from a 1969 paper where they had 300 pathologists doing two measurements. And then a later paper, there's even 800, more than 800 labs. There's no Uden plot there. And then uh, again, in I guess another version of the inner laboratory studies, if they measure more than uh, two materials, capital L materials, you could sum, you could rank within each uh, material, the lab, sum the ranks, and based on a permeant of the distributions, you could decide whether the uh, extremes were, um, you know, different. He, I guess I'll keep moving. He probably at least thought about, you know, the Wilcox and Rank sum test. That's a little different, but it's kind of neat that Wilcoxon was in the next lab at BTI, joined about the same time, left about the same time, and they were both becoming statisticians, I think, about the same time. Okay, this is pretty neat. Uh, another, before you even do an inner laboratory study, you should get an idea how that's going to come out. And one way you do that is you could vary uh, all the different uh, variables or aspects that you think would make uh, different laboratories different because they have different reagents, different uh, machines and so forth. And you know, so he proposes using fully saturated designs, you know, the two to the seven minus four is just our, you know, two level fully fat, fully fractionated design. There's the plaque of Berman 12, and but you know you run eight or twelve runs and you get an idea how much variability. Uh, I mean you'll see how much variability you get and you'll get an idea whether you're even ready to send it out for an inner laboratory study, which involves a lot of labs and a lot of expense. And all this this is a little different than Taguchi's robust parameter design. It has kind of the same flavor. And, uh, you know, this was, well, you know, we in the West only became aware of Taguchi's methods in the 1980s. And uh, I, anyways, it's, it's kind of interesting that, you know, just to see that comparison. And then he does the same thing where, you know, physical constants, MBS, 
was involved in uh, measuring things like the speed of light at the time. And so every time someone did a new experiment, the, the new best estimate didn't, wasn't even in the previous uncertainty of from previous experiments. So he proposed really doing these same kind of full, fully fractionated designs. Um, I think I'll just skip that. Well, this, this one here, he has a trivariate response. Let's see, what year was, I can't see this because something, this window's hiding some of this stuff anyways. But he figures out, I mean, it's a neat paper. He, he figures out that he can uh, reduce it to a univariate response and uh, do regression and get you know, what he really wants. Uh, kind of pretty neat for that time. So uh, I guess in summary, he wasn't a mathematical statistician. Uh, he wasn't a combinatorial designer, but he invented a number of designs. Actually, he had two colleagues, Connor and Clatworthy, who were R.C. Bowe's, you know, PhD students that came a couple of years after Uden. So they certainly had combinator combinatorial designers at National Bureau of Standards. And uh, just kind of what we've I've been saying he practiced statistics, solving problems for his clients. He did research to meet the needs. Um, he improved practices, existing practices. He developed new designs, found surprising new uses of existing designs and developed new analysis methods. And he could explain things well, especially using graphical methods. I mean, he had the benefit of understanding his clients, scientists and engineers. I mean, he was one. He was a you know, PhD analytical chemist, but it, it's, this quote is great. He was often heard telling a client in consultation or audience at one of his well-attended lectures that he was a chemist and plight. He really was not a statistician. So, you know, my conclusion, he, you know, not just an applied statistician, he was a you know, master applied statistician. So, um, I, you know, after, you know, reading you then, I realized what an honor, or really what an honor this is to give this talk. And uh, just, the, it was, it's been a privilege, you know, to learn from a master. So, you know, the 18 months uh, was well worth spending it. It you know, wasn't just for preparing for this talk. And there's actually a couple other neat things I found um, just by, you know, immersing myself uh, in his work. Okay, I think that's it. Adam. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Should I stop sharing or what? No, I think stop. you can you can keep keep sharing uh, your screen. I think that's that's fine. We uh, we have some time for for questions now. I haven't I haven't observed any uh, questions in the in the question and answer. Uh, if you if you have them, um, please go ahead and type them in the chat into the chat as well. If you, if you wanted either one of those. Um, it, while we're while we're waiting, I have a, I have a question myself, uh, Mike, and a sure. comment. So on one of your on one of your slides, you noted that uh, you didn't used um, four hundred sets of random normals. So I'm I'm assuming that he looked these up in a, a table of random normals, which seems very impressive to me. Uh, so, so that was that really struck me as something I would have never thought that 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 you <laughs> that that uh, it must have taken a long time. But I, th I think there were tables by the Rand Corporation or something. Oh yeah, one of those companies even back in the '40s. So there were numbers, but yeah, the 
how to, to do that by hand. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. Very, very impressive. Very impressive. So we have a couple of, of questions. Uh, do you want, I'll read them, Mike, if that's okay. Yeah, uh, I can hear you barely. You were a lot clearer a week ago. Okay, well, I'll try to, I'll try to speak up and speak a little closer to the microphone. Um, so the first question is from, from Keith, who says, uh, thank you, I enjoyed the talk. And can you say more about Uden's current legacy? Is he more remembered or forgotten? Um, well, I think it's helpful to have uh, these uh, talks that have occurred at about every 14 years. Cornell gave one in 1992. He seems to give, have given maybe almost the same talk in 2006. And then, of course, Jim Philbin gave the talk in uh, 2019. So I, I guess I'm a bit of an outlier. Uh, but um, I think, yeah, people just, you know, read. Uh, they'll, if they read three things, you know, the statistics for chemistry book showing how he, you know, introduced statistics to the chemists and the statistical design um, columns, the 36 columns, you know, you started reading some of that. It's some pretty amazing stuff. And then this um, experiment and measurement book, you know, it's, it's for high school students, ha ha. <laughs> I would read it. It's pretty neat. Um, actually, here were the references, uh, the Joiner and Matrella bibliographies. Hey, he has a Google Scholar profile now. Uh, just do Google Scholar profile you then on Google, you should be able to find it. You don't have to worry about the link. And uh, one of these papers I didn't talk about, you know, I, I clipped this the other day, his 1950 paper in cancer, an index for rating diagnostic tests. You look at the bottom, almost 8,000 citations, 2,200 in the last two years. We're not done with 2021 yet. You know, what is it? Well, the diagnostic test, do you have a disease or not? There are four. Uh, rates, uh, false positive and negative, and true positive and negative. And he incorporates all that in a index. So I bet a lot of these papers, and I didn't check all 2200, you know, have something to do with COVID testing. So, you know, whether we know it or not, I, I guess the question was, I think he's still very relevant, but I think talks like these, uh, you know, maybe every few years will remind uh, people about his legacy. So maybe it's his legacy, even though we don't always aware of it. You know, through the interlaboratory studies, uh, there's the award and then uh, the Uden Technometrics paper, but. Um, Anyways. Thank you. So, so we have a, a couple of more questions. So there was the, the next question is, is from Jose Daniel Montañez. You mentioned an article named Special Report. Can you repeat how to get a copy? I, I don't remember that that one, Mike. Do you do you know what um, I mean, is being just, referred to there? No, you just type in experimentation measurement. Now that's the title of the book. Uden, you could put NBS. I think you'll find it, but it's special report 672. So National Bureau of Standards of republished it in 1984. I think oh. you'll be able to find it. If you really can't, you know, send me an email. Okay. And it's, and it's free. 
there are, uh, there are a few links in the chat uh, and a suggestion for what to, to the phrase to Google to find the special report. So thank, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Aaron. Um, another uh, question from Kingsley. A nice presentation. Uh, in the summary, may I ask in what field is Uden's findings mainly applicable to? Well, I think, you know, physical and uh, physical science and, and engineers. And he was, you know, what, what, you know, what I don't, you know, talk about or someone could talk about is, you know, really his missionary efforts into all kinds of engineering, um, I guess operations research, metal industry, you know, chemical, uh, obviously, obviously chemical and chemical engineering and then the hard sciences of, you know, for the physical constants, the work that NIST does. And uh, I think anything, you know, related to, I mean, very relevant to ASQ statistics division um, work in industry. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Mike, for a wonderful presentation. So it's it's two o two now. So we should uh, wrap things up. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, this is a very good kickoff to our twenty one FTC webinar series. Thank you all. <laughs>